I'm Bob Moore, the Chief Medical Officer of Partnership Health Plan and Vice Chair of the Coalition for Compassionate Care. And I've been, uh, uh, I'll be doing the last bit of facilitation of the last couple talks and making some closing remarks. I hope you'll stay to the end. We have some, uh, we have our amazing uh, closing keynote and then I'll try to make some uh, remarks that will hopefully frame the day at the end. So, But first I'm going to kick off this session by introducing the facilitator of this afternoon's session, which is uh, Dr. Um, uh, Michael Fratkin. He's a palliative care physician, founder and director of Resolution Care. He's a builder, an innovator, and a dreamer who approaches life and the practice of medicine with love and respect. Standing on a foundation of approaches I'm sorry, standing on a foundation of inspiration and burnout, Dr. Fratkin began creating Resolution Care Network to build capacity for capable and compassionate palliative care in the northern, of rural Northern California community in which, which he makes his home. He has been a transformative and provocative voice for improving the experience of people and families facing the completion of their lives while ensuring that the meaningful professional experiences of those providing care of, is of equal performance. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fratkin. Do I stay seated? Is that? I stay seated. So thank you all for hanging in there. It's been a great couple of days and I'm uh, absolutely delighted to play this role. Um, I will uh, go ahead and introduce the people that are sitting up here with me. Uh, this is Linda Blum. She uh, works at uh, California Pacific uh, Medical Center as an uh, inpatient palliative care consultant. To my right, the eminent Carl Steinberg, uh, a, a leader in uh, long-term care and uh, nursing home provision of palliative care, as well as uh, a um, member of the organizing board for the California Coalition of Compassionate Care. And Samantha. Peyon, thank you so much, who's uh, an uh, associate director at the California Medical Association, the CMA, um, with uh, leadership on the topic of opioid um, uh, challenges. So when I was initially asked to sit on an expert panel related to the dynamics of opioid prescribing in the fields of hospice and palliative medicine, I was like, what? <laughs> Who's an expert in that? Um, the world is changing so quickly. Um, the policy clarifications are coming at rapid clip. Um, all of us, all of you in the community have your own experiences. And so I proposed the idea of structuring this as a town hall meeting. Um, but then I thought about that, and I was like, no, I can't get that picture of maybe Carl walking around behind me, kind of lurking in the background. So we won't call it a town hall, um, but I think what we'll call it is a family meeting. Um, Y'all are family, um, each of us working in unique um, but related environments, taking care of people uh, suffering from you know, great difficulties with pain and other symptoms that are uh, opioid sensitive. You, some of you have been around for a minute and a half since you've just finished your training. Others of us have been um, doing this work for decades and watching things change over and over again. Um, so we're gonna have a family meeting. And the way I would invite you to participate is in the way that you would invite family members to participate, which is to be concise and clear and bring forward, if you can, solutions, ideas, thoughts. Your family must be a lot different from mine. <laughs> I, th this is the ideal oh, okay. family that we're talking about. <laughs> this is not my family, I promise okay, you. All right. um, so, um, so keep the comments. We want to get as many people to give voice to their own perspectives along the way um, as they possibly can. Um, so at the mic, think a couple of minutes and think as you acknowledge uh, a difficulty or challenge that you face or name something, see if it's possible to name some form of solution or uh, a new way of thinking about it. Um, 
staff from the CCCC will be uh, taking notes, um, and uh, we are recording this. So we're going to try and compile uh, some meaningful little report that captures uh, and memorializes uh, the set of concerns, questions, ideas that come forward. Um, and so, just to give you a sense of how dynamic things are, um, I just tweeted out a uh, Bloomberg News article um, that identifies uh, an opioid evangelist switches sides in case alleging pharma abuse. So this is one of our great pioneers, one of my mentors, um, a man that has informed the last 20 plus years of uh, palliative care program development and good symptom management, Russell Portnoy. Um, he is a, uh, he's a giant. And he's subject to that kind of headline because we are in a time of great change. Um, in addition, um, there was a CDC and ASCO clarification that also was off embargo this morning. Um, and it basically uh, clarifies the CDC guidelines to exclude cancer patients and pain control, cancer survivors with treatment associated pain, and people suffering from sickle cell disease from the recently published uh, somewhat austere recommendations for opioid use. Um, it states that there's no an intention to exclude from access to opioids uh, those three important groups. It is today both of these things came out. So this is rapidly changing, and I, I would argue that there really are no experts in the field. So I would like to begin, I think, with Samantha. Are you going to go forward with your few slides? Everybody hear me? No? Check, check, check. Yeah? All right, how about now? Great, great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Michael said, my name is Samantha Payone. I'm with the California Medical Association. And I just want to thank the Coalition for Compassionate Care for inviting me here to speak on behalf of this topic. It's an area that CMA has been heavily engaged upon for many years now, and it's one in which our member physicians care very deeply about. Um, and they recognize that uh, medical leadership is needed to address what is a very real crisis in terms of opioids. But they also see that enacted policies have real life uh, impacts on the patients that they care for. And that includes not just patients who may suffer from opioid use disorder, it also includes patients who may also have pain. So um, just real quickly, I have no conflicts of interest other than being a CMA employee. Um, this is a slide I'm sure many of you have seen time and time again. And, you know, basically it does highlight the fact over the last few decades we've had a rapid increase in drug overdose deaths, um, specifically attributed to prescription opioids. And uh, 2017 numbers show that that number has increased even more. We're looking at about 70,000 drug overdose deaths. Um, but I would point out that uh, the data that's coming out over the last several years show that some of these use patterns have changed. And we're seeing this, this rapid increase being driven by use of illicit drugs like fentanyl and heroin. And when you actually look at the numbers, almost two thirds of the drug overdose deaths is attributed to these illicit drugs. Now when we drill down to some of the California stats here, um, California, uh, by um, comparison to the national average, has a pretty low drug overdose rate uh, for opioid, related to opioids. Um, it's a rate of 5.3 deaths per 100,000 persons, and the national average is 14.6 deaths. Um, and that top line there is uh, prescription opioids. So you can see we still do have a fair amount that is attributed to prescription opioids. 
Um, but the increases that we're seeing um, have been those lower two lines there uh, related to fentanyl and heroin. Um, and we're talking about, we're not talking about diverted pharmaceutical fentanyl. This is fentanyl that's coming from overseas. Um, and I just want to point out, too, that that top line in terms of prescription opioids, um, you can see that it is trending downward, or at the very least has stabilized. So where are we at in terms of uh, the number of prescriptions that are being given out that are opioids? Well, uh, California ranks um, is one of the lowest prescribing rates in terms of opioid prescriptions. Um, providers, California providers, write 39, almost 40 opioid prescriptions for every 100 persons. Um, in comparison, the national average is 60 opioid prescriptions per 100 persons. Um, so just to summarize here in terms of what we're seeing here in California, the data is showing us that over this time frame from 2013 to 2017, we've had a 24% decrease in opioid prescriptions. We've had around a 15, 14% increase in terms of bup prescriptions or medication-assisted treatment. And California is only one of only five states that have had multi-year decreases in prescription opioid overdoses. So we're definitely doing something right. Um, we're tied with Hawaii for the lowest opioid prescription rate in the country. With that said, there are still pockets, uh, of course, in certain counties and northern counties that do have extremely high rates of opioid overdoses. And a lot of the efforts that we're seeing at the local level are really targeting those um, efforts at the community. So what has California done that makes us unique um, in terms of the data that we're seeing here? And it's really been a comprehensive, multifaceted approach. And I just want to point out that in terms of safe prescribing, California was one of the first states to enact safe prescribing guidelines. The Medical Board of California adopted their clinical guidelines for controlled substances back in 2014. And this is well before the CDC guidelines came out with their um, clinical guidelines in 2016. And um, it really helped kind of set the bar for what the gold standard should be in California. We've also had laws that have sought to increase access to naloxone um, to ensure that there are liability protections, that pharmacists are able to furnish naloxone, um, and that there are coverage for various formulations. Um, there have also been efforts to address stigma through public education campaigns, which are still ongoing. I mentioned the local opioid safety coalitions. Um, and then, of course, really increasing access to treatment, substance use disorder services, funding substance use disorder services, um, and that is inclusive of medication-assisted treatment. So with that said, despite the progress that California and the medical community <laughs> have made towards addressing the opioid crisis, we've seen a number of different legislative efforts, um, particularly last year, um, that still target prescription uh, uh, prescribing practices. And these are just some of the news clips that we saw from over 2018 with some of the different bills that were proposed. Um, and there were over last year alone 20 bills in the California legislature that were related to opioids. At the federal level, there are over 100 proposals related to opioids in 2018 before the, the U.S. Congress. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but just to give you an idea of the breadth of different legislative proposals that were um, before us, um, you can see the range here. Some of these did pass, some of these didn't, and some of these were dealing with what that means like now on an implementation standpoint. So this chart reflects what is happening nationally. Okay? California is not unique. We're seeing other states who are passing in statute opioid prescri prescription limits that deal with dosage and duration. 33 states have enacted legislation with some type of limit related to opioid prescribing. Some of those are you only can prescribe up to a three-day supply if you have a patient with, with acute pain. Some of those relate to you cannot prescribe past a certain dosage amount, for instance, 90 MME. Um, if your patient has chronic pain. Um, but we're seeing this trend that has happened over the last several years. Um, I would say California has been able to um, work at this at a more kind of nuanced point of view. Um, and we haven't had any dosage or duration limits um, that have passed. We're also dealing with different pharmacies and payers who are implementing their own limits, um, Walmart, CVS, um, Medicare just passed their Part D policy, which will now put a seven-day supply limit for any opioid-naive patient. 
And um, what we're also seeing, what we're hearing from our member physicians is that they're getting asked for increasingly more medical documentation to justify the prescribing decision that they've made. So they're asked to provide treatment agreements, um, tried failed therapies, um, diagnoses codes before the uh, opioid prescription will be filled by, uh, at a pharmacy. And not only does that have the dual um, barrier of, of, of impeding patients' access to medications when they made it in a timely manner, but it also can create administrative burden. Now, this is a new project um, that the medical board has um, been working on. It's called the Death Certificate Project. And um, basically, the medical board entered into an interagency agreement with the California Department of Public Health to obtain death certificate data from 2012 to 2013 using the underlying, underlying cause of death and the contributing cause, cause of death. They identified opioid-related deaths and then compare that to data in the prescription drug monitoring program, which is CURES here in California, to identify who the prescriber was. Um, they then sent those reports to expert reviewers to indicate where there may be instances um, of potential overprescribing. And here are some of the numbers that we've, um, that we've seen. They identified over 500 cases. There have been 11 accusations filed so far, and over 200 remaining cases still are under investigation. Um, there are plans to obtain 2015, 2016, and 2017 data from CDPH. So this will be an ongoing effort on behalf of the medical board. All right. So we have all these forces that are working together to address opioid supply. We have um, state regulators, federal regulators. We have statute limits. We also have law enforcement. Um, and so we're definitely seeing an impact in terms of patients and in terms of their um, access to, to, to care. And the question that has been um, difficult to resolve is how do we improve care for these people in an era challenged by the opioid crisis? Um, and I think that, uh, unfortunately, what we're hearing is that it's led to situations where clinicians are having to make some really difficult decisions or being, um, uh, some patients are having to go through a forced taper um, in instances where it may not be clinically indicated. Um, and there are even some instances where some prescribers are saying, well, I just don't want to prescribe opioids anymore and I'm just going to give up my DEA certificate. Um, and so we have to be cognizant of this tension between both of these different public health crises, um, particularly with patients with chronic pain, because we know that stigma, stigma is a thing, not just for folks who may suffer from opioid use disorder, but for patients who may be on a stable opioid regimen and um, treating their pain. Um, in fact, there is a growing concern that um, there may be increases in suicide as a result of unrelieved pain and a lack of access to treatment. So I don't want to leave without um, at least bringing a little bit of hope. Um, how, do we, you know, how do we address this symbiotic relationship between both of these crises? And I just want to say that there is starting to, I am starting to see more of a pendulum swing to the middle. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services recently convened a pain management best practices task force. And they put forward a draft report that was released early this year. Um, the comment period just closed on it, and it really offers a comprehensive assessment of the gaps and opportunities to improve pain treatment. Um, it's also the first government document to publicly acknowledge that a review of the CDC guidelines is needed. Um, and they recognize that while the CDC guidelines have been useful for prescribers, they were intended as voluntary recommendations for primary care physicians in treating chronic pain. Um, and unfortunately, we've seen some of the misapplication of the CDC guidelines in other instances, um, and that there could be more um, guidance provided for a patient who may already be on a stable opioid regimen in terms of management of their pain. Um, as I note here, and I um, highlighted it, the, the report states the CDC guideline was not intended to be model legislation for state legislators to enact. Um, so I'm just going to leave uh, with a few notes in terms of some of our advocacy that we'll be focused on this year in 2019. 
Uh, as I mentioned, the final report, that's going to go to Congress, and I imagine there may be some legislation from that. The medical board itself will be revising its clinical guidelines. Um, they, as I mentioned, it came out with them in 2014, so they'll be re reviewing that process this year. There's still the great work that um, CDPH is doing with their public health efforts um, at the state level. Um, DHCS has been doing some really great work around funding uh, medication-assisted treatment and their hub-and-spoke model. Um, I just read in an article last uh, yesterday that over 13,000 patients have re received medication-assisted treatment as a result of these efforts. So um, it's really great what they're doing. Um, and then lastly, Department of Justice will be uh, going through their rulemaking process for cures um, to come out later this year. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues now. Thank you. Um, well, I was, I was kind of wrong about experts. She's an expert in the context and current state of things. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Am I on here? Am I on now? Am I on now? Almost. Well, in the meantime, I'll show you my... No, you're well, on. I'm on now. <laughs> um, I didn't bring pink socks, but I, uh, I thought in honor of Michael and also being in Northern California, I'd wear my tie-dye. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I have a couple of slides, mainly uh, just so I could show a picture of my dogs. Let's see. Hey, where are they? Where's your dogs? Maybe, so maybe somebody can pull up my slides while I'm sitting here uh -huh. chit-chatting. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'd like to say... There we go. Yeah. Um, I'm an expert on opioids, and it's not just because I've been a, a hospice medical director since 1995, or as I like to say, long before it was fashionable. Um, but I also had my own substance abuse disorder. I, I had a chronic pain syndrome, and I just feel like, you know, that, that talk from Dr. Horowitz this morning put me in this total, like, uh, self-disclosure and, uh, you know, <laughs> feel-good kind of mood. But, you know, I have 27 years clean and sober. Yeah, go ahead and give me a hand for that. Um, um, but anyway, I, I mean, I, so I know, uh, and it runs in my family, and I, so I guess I was an opioid addict uh, before that was uh, fashionable, too, and uh, uh, I guess that term has fallen out of favor, but uh, in any event, um, I, these slides are mainly, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time, because really we want to hear from you guys. There's my girls that go to nursing homes with me all the time, my claim to fame. Um, so just backing up a little bit from Samantha, uh, you know, you all know the history of opioids, where they came from. I think the important thing to note is that um, they're one of the very best tools we have in our toolkit, right? They're one of the most extraordinarily effective pain relievers, and also they're very good for other symptoms like dyspnea and, and uh, diarrhea. And we absolutely need to have access to them in the population we look after. Um, you know, the, the tolerance, uh, dependence, and all that, kind of business and the other side effects, those have been known for a long time. So there, there's nothing really new about it. And we've tried over the years to look for new opioids or, you know, new meds that are better and, you know, heroin, it was going to be, it was so heroic, it was going to deliver us from opium and, uh, and morphine and, and none of that really has happened so far. Um, and we've seen the pendulum shift in both directions. Uh, I think just from a California standpoint, uh, we do have uh, these new prescription forms that are, that are going to have to be sequential. Uh, and most of you are probably familiar with the 11159.2 exemption, the prescribers, where you don't have to have a special prescription blank if you are um, prescribing for somebody who's terminally ill. So that's one good little piece of information. Um, and this is the best article I've ever read on opioids, and so I just wanted to put the link up there, and I'm sure it'll be available on the, uh, on the website. Um, it's called The Poison We Pick, and it, it's, it's a long read, but it is absolutely fabulous. It's got a little, you know, it's got some poetry in it, it's got some stories, and it's got an amazing history. So I, I really highly recommend that. And then I just want to give a little, you know, I'm a nursing home doctor. Um, and I've had multiple personal experiences where this crackdown on opioids has caused problems. Um, I think one was a, a longtime chronic pain patient um, who's functionally quadriplegic from an old uh, spinal cord injury um, and uh, has kind of a central pain syndrome that's been well controlled with morphine. Suddenly, I, the pharmacy just arbitrarily said, we cannot give him more than a, you know, 
seven tablets in a one week period. Um, and so, you know, the arbitrariness and the potential destructiveness of that, I think, are really obvious. Um, and that's just one small example. There are many, many examples, and I think we've seen, as Samantha mentioned, a lot of prescribers are, are just um, saying, I'm not going to prescribe opioids, period, because I don't want those black marks on my record. Um, I don't want to be, I don't want to have somebody OD and then have the medical board come after me. Um, and, or I'm going to stop ordering, you know, good opioids, good potent opioids, and I'm going to start prescribing, um, you know, tramadol or something like that, and uh, which is maybe appropriate in some cases, but certainly uh, not appropriate on a large scale basis. And one thing I want to mention, just so I don't forget, is um, buprenorphine can be a very useful medication for, uh, for pain, and you do not have to have a special DEA number to prescribe it if you're using it for pain. So, uh, you know, Suboxone that, that uh, is available for addiction treatment also uh, can be used for pain. So th just something to keep in mind for people that don't tolerate uh, uh, traditional pure agonist opioids. Thank you. Cool. I actually want to, is there somebody out here that's willing, it's gone, um, willing to uh, tweet out uh, Andrew Sullivan's piece? When I saw this slide from Carl, I read it this morning, and it really is uh, a spectacular, um, broad sweep social assessment of the relationship we have as a society uh, with this group of, of drugs, so I highly recommend it. There's another one that's mentioned in the Andrew Sullivan piece for anybody who's interested called Dreamland, uh, The True Tale of America's Opioid e Epidemic by Sam Canones. Can yeah, Canones in yeah. 2015. I just read it and finished it this past week. It's phenomenal. It's a really excellent So Linda book. Blum, nurse practitioner, would you please tell them a little <laughs> bit about that book? So the, this book is about the parallel stories of the rise of black tar heroin coming from Jalisco in Mexico, which is a small city or township in uh, Nayarit province, and the rise in opiate prescriptions, particularly oxycodone and pill mills in Appalachia, and how they work together, um, and how the Jalisco boys piggybacked on the pill epidemic in middle America. Um, to create an opioid epidemic and for the people on Oxy to move to black tar heroin. It was, it's a, fa a well-written, well-researched, and a fascinating read. So will somebody out there tweet the Andrew Sullivan article, Doug Wilson, and will somebody out there tweet uh, a uh, link to the Dreamland book? Yes, thank you, Kayla. Um, good. And then what I wanted to ask you as well, uh, Kate Myers from California Healthcare Foundation is working on a project that assesses our experience as members of palliative care clinical teams. Who in the room is the, a member of a palliative care clinical team? So um, this survey will provide CHCF a modest database that asks you certain questions about how you're experiencing opioid prescribing in your practice. Um, and how many of those people who raised their hands a moment ago would be willing to complete this survey? It took about seven minutes and it was interesting and gave an opportunity to kind of share what your, my experience was with uh, opioid prescribing. How many of you would be willing to do it? Well, come on, you guys, come on. All right, well, then everyone who raised their hands, maybe even the first time, but especially the second time, can you take out a pen and tell me when you're ready? Ready? So it's surveymonkey.com slash lowercase r slash, the remaining letters are all capitals, B as in boy, S as in Sam, F as in Frank, X as in X, P as in Poodle, M as in Michael, 
R as in rainbow. rainbow. <laughs> so I'll say it again for everyone. And, and let me know if you haven't gotten it, but it's surveymonkey.com slash lowercase r slash capital B S F X P M R. Quiz to follow. Quiz to follow. So thank you um, for uh, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, as well as social workers, nurses, community health workers, chaplains, anyone who's actively involved in the clinical delivery of palliative care. One small thing, if you are primarily working in an inpatient environment, there's a field where you'll put your name if you like, but if you'd also just identify yourself as an inpatient palliative care provider, that would be a little extra um, useful. How'd I do, Kate? Is that good? Yeah? Okay, good. So um, what I want to do now is open up this meeting uh, to the rest of the family. Um, I'll tell you the two things that are uh, under my skin as an a organizational developer for a community uh, program. Um, at the end of last year, the Cures 2.0 mandated reporting um, was enacted in October of 2018. And instantly, we were not just able to use the Cures database as a part of our global interdisciplinary assessment of risk of redistribution and the like, and to track prescribing patterns for people we had a reason to track. We were instantly uh, mandated to um, get a report anytime we initiated a drug. Anytime there was concurrent benzos, any assessment of increased risk, or um, and to provide education around. Oh, I'm talking about the wrong thing. Sorry. For for the first time prescriptions within 24 hours of making those prescriptions, and then once every four months. The burden of doing that for a hospice or a palliative care program is quite substantial. We have about 185, 190 people under care, and to create the systems to do that effectively um, are very burdensome. Um, and um, hospices have an exemption. So they thought to include hospices as an exempted entity in the rollout of that law, but they didn't think to include palliative care programs that may not be associated with a hospice organization. So that's one beef. The other beef is all of a sudden, January came around, and the naloxone mandated offer, offer to prescribe law, uh, snuck up on me. Did it sneak up on anybody else? Well, you guys were all ready for the naloxone <laughs> prescribing offer. I didn't know a thing about it. Well, apparently, it um, uh, was assigned uh, to the law late in the year, and then uh, starting January 1st, Anyone who is getting greater than 90 milligrams of morphine equivalent per day, a concurrent benzo, or would be assessed to have some increased risk of overdose, um, must be offered um, naloxone um, and uh, all the education implied and all the documentation implied. Um, and they did this time think of exempting certain categories of patients, um, but that category uh, were incarcerated individuals and juveniles. They did not include an exemption for hospice organizations nor for palliative care organizations, despite the fact by, that putting naloxone into the home of people who are in the last parts of their life um, has a much higher likelihood of causing harm than preventing it. Has anyone ever seen somebody that got, uh, got naloxone after being on opioids? They wake up really happy, don't they? Yeah. I, I'm being sarcastic. Pretty much so, like instant withdrawal. So these are two topics to just invite you to come up and share your own uh, input. Those are my two local concerns that I don't have an answer to. Um, so the mics are open. Please come on up, family. What are you all facing out there? We want a horror story. Well, no, or whatever you got. Bring what you got. Bring what you got. Uh, so I have a question 
and a frustration. So as I travel to different conferences and digital technology and wearables, there's so much about VR and augmented reality for pain relief. And the only place I'm seeing it is at conferences and at a few places here, maybe at Cedars Sinai. Why are we not moving the needle and trying to get this to patients? Because I have patients that I work with that want this technology because they don't want the opioids, but we just can't get it. And I'm in northern New Jersey, right outside of Manhattan. Grace, could you just tell people your expertise? So I'm a board-certified patient advocate specializing in the oncology space. I work with patients and their loved ones from point of diagnosis through survivorship or end-of-life care planning. Thanks. And uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and do you want to talk about non-pharmacologic -pharmacolog interventions? Well, and I think there's, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot more focus on non-pharmacological interventions since this big, you know, push against opioids and the increased uh, scrutiny. And certainly there's all kinds of other alternatives. I, I think the virtual reality is something that's just kind of heading out of the gate now. And I, I suspect we'll see a lot more of that. Um, but, all, you know, a lot of other complementary and alternative medicine modalities, um, you know, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy of various types. And um, I think, you know, they're not new things to us who work in palliative care, but I think we're going to those more and more and, you know, trying to save opioids for, uh, for the most severe cases. At the risk of being, am I live? At the risk of being a Luddite, um, virtual reality is just a form of distraction. It's not much different than watching a movie or, you know, um, binge watching a TV show. So, um, yeah, unless it's point. something particularly structured for guided meditation, which is the comment from the back, mm -hmm. and, and that's true of anything, it is just a tool, it's not, nothing magic. It all depends on the content. Um, just this may or may not sound at all relevant to you, but in the Andrew Sullivan article, he talks about the uh, the research that you're probably all familiar with, where they put a rat in a cage with a bar to press for cocaine, and the results of that very uh, simple study showed that rats will push the bar for cocaine in uh, in preference to food and water, and sometimes will will die as a result. Well. Uh, a revision of that study um, took uh, rats and put them in two cages, one of which had a morphine solution, and the other had a morphine, the same morphine solution, but um, rat fun, like balls and fuzzy things and warm stuff and other rats to have rat good times. It was like rat <laughs> Disneyland next to rat jail. And it turns out in rat jail, the rats consumed five times as much morphine than they did in rat Disneyland, where other mechanisms for getting their needs met, their physiologic, psycho-spiritual needs were being met in the Disneyland rat park. So that may have something to do a little bit with the idea of non-pharmacological -pharmacolo interventions, or virtual reality, or guided meditation, or isolation, and loneliness, and all those things that give our patients the experience of total pain or total suffering. Go ahead, Kayla. Hi, I'm Kayla. Um, I'm a third year medical student, and... Yeah, uh, baby. Thank you. Um, so something I worry about because I think you guys might not be aware there's a, a whole generation of future physicians right now who are being educated with really just fear, scare tactics. If I didn't have Twitter, I would have never heard of the pro side of using opioids for pain. If, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my colleagues don't use Twitter. Uh, so something I, I worry about and I want to, I guess, raise awareness of and maybe hear your thoughts on are how to um, get this other side because I think we're, we're shown in very black and white terms like opioids bad or opioids good. Um, and right now the louder voice is bad and they're scary and um, I think a lot of my classmates will be afraid to prescribe their patients opioids even if they are indicated. And so um, your thoughts on that and how to, I guess, reach future physicians when um, in our curriculum right now the focus has really been on not prescribing opioids. 
I mean, certainly the AMA is working on this, and, and a lot of the other professional organizations, AAHPM, um, you know, they're trying to get the word out that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, even though, you know, white kids are dying from opioid overdoses nowadays, so we care about it. Um, so I think, uh, you know, anything you can do on the front lines to help, but I, I think it's really important for the professional organizations to ensure that education is being given in a balanced way. And, that we remember that opioids are extraordinarily useful drugs in some cases. But, you know, th this is how it was years ago. They didn't give opioids for, unless you were dying of cancer or just immediately post-operatively. I mean, you know, when some of us old folks were going through medical school. So mm -hmm. I hope we'll see the pendulum come back to a more reasonable middle ground at some point. Is there, are there any medical school faculty in the room or former faculty? Do you have any thoughts about what, what's needed in <laughs> tamping down or mitigating this sort of fear-based polarity, the black and the white. <laughs> Would you share? Thank you. So as, as a Stanford Medical School faculty, I teach pharmacology. Um, it's very clear that the only way you get addicted to opiates is if your pain is untreated or poorly treated. This makes you have drug-seeking behavior. Mm. So if you under-treat pain, you will create addicts because they will seek pain relief and they will seek it in any way they can. So if you under-treat pain, you create people who seek pain relief. And so how do they seek it? They seek it any way they can. If they're really smart, they seek non-pharmacologic remedies for their pain and they rehab themselves and they get better. If you give them opioids and over-treat them with opiates, they get addicted to opiates. Because guess what? It feels good to some people. Um, some people don't like opiates. However, if you want to create a culture of addicted people, you under-treat their pain and then you make lots of pills on the shelf and they go find them and they squirrel them away so that they have them in case the pain gets bad. And then they're there and any time they have a crisis, they turn to the pills, which is what's been happening in our country. But don't under-treat pain or you will create a series of people who seek pain medications. The studies are very, very clear, okay? So don't under-treat pain or you will create people who seek pain relief. Ergo, they will seek narcotics because it gets them out of pain. <clears throat> so this is a very simplified version of what you should already know as people who We'll do have you make prep really. PowerPoint slides next time. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate but, that. And when they run really? out of the opioids on the shelf, that's when they'll go down to the corner. And, you know, it's cheap. Heroin's cheap nowadays. These Chinese fentanyl, it's dirt cheap. You know, back, back in the 70s, Chinese you Chinese fentanyl, had to, don't do it. It was 150 bucks a day to stay, to stay loaded on heroin. Now, you know, $25 a day. I mean, you can be a barista and easily stay loaded. And, and uh, so that's uh, part of the problem. Cheap and plentiful, like CME credits. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name's Laura. I'm the palliative care nurse in Los. We'll look, look closer. My name's Laura, and I'm the palliative care nurse in um, Ventura County at a hospital there. Um, I'm glad to hear that the pendulum might be starting to slip back more to a neutral place. Um, my hospital is part of the HCA healthcare system, and they threw out looking at pain as the fifth vital sign because they felt that. If we keep asking them all day long, do you have pain, do you have pain, that we're somehow creating their need for pain. So it's, so anyway, I'm yeah, glad to hear uh, things are better. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Shabnam Yekta. I'm a palliative care physician at John Muir in the East Bay. And um, we, you know, pride ourselves in palliative care of being this interdisciplinary team, and it's a wonderful group of people from all different backgrounds, but I wonder how many pharmacists are in the group? 
And wow, look at them all. <laughs> I was lucky enough to train in an environment where we had a palliative care pharmacist that worked on our team, both on an outpatient clinic and within our inpatient service. And it made a world of difference in terms of the education that we were able to give patients regarding the opiates that they were taking and improving safety. And I feel like we should do a better job of trying to collaborate with our pharmacy colleagues um, to be part of this interdisciplinary team. For sure, for sure. How many um, of the programs represented here have uh, integrated pharmacy as a part of their teams? A few. Okay. Hopefully next year when we ask that same question, we'll have a few more hands in the air. Come on up. Hello. Um, I'm Jean LaHaye. I'm the past president of the American Society for Pain Management Nursing uh, Bay Area chapter. Um, and I have a question for you in terms of um, offering um, alternatives to opioids, um, including like the, um, the um, lidocaine patch, the, um, uh, um, some of the other patches like um, diclofenac patch and what have you. I know for a long time they were considered too expensive now we're seeing uh, lidocaine patches, for example, in the, um, in the pharmacies. So I'm just wondering, is there a push from C CME um, to, um, to allow those to come down in price or what have you, or are there alternatives? Mm -hmm. I know there was a mention of tramadol, but that's a, a, a weekly binding um, um, opioid. So it, you know, anything that's going to compete with it is going to knock it off the MU receptor. So are there other alternatives um, for providing pain besides the opioids that we can offer people? Um, I would say from an advocacy standpoint, um, CMA recognizes that you can't just say you can't prescribe opioids and then not offer an alternative to a patient. Um, unfortunately, what we've seen is some of these non-pharmacologic or non-opioid alternatives aren't always covered. Um, services. And so you get to a situation where a physician is trying to figure out, you know, what, what are the other options we can provide this patient. Um, and so that's always a concern that we're looking to try and extend out. Um, but I would also point out, too, around making sure that the, the integrative care is, is evidence-based and physician-led. Um, and that's definitely something that we support. All right. Can I just show you something before? You show me some. Is it your dog or your cat? No, that is my left knee. My That's not right. Wow. That I'm just going to say I'm a doctor. That is not right. <laughs> and, well, and you don't have to be a doctor to see that's not right. <laughs> and the, um, the, uh, this was a work injury, and uh, um, the workman's comp decided that, you know, when they decided to stop the Percocet that I was getting, was in the middle of physical therapy, which... By the way, was mm -hmm. I was, you know, I call it torture, but it was helping me. I mean, the leaps and bounds I was making was enormous, but without pain medication, uh, I went home and I would drink three shots of bourbon. Not the best way. <laughs> so the, I just wanted to, you know, give you a little personal perspective. The person who denied me the, the Percocet was not my doctor, was not my pharmacist, was some workman's comp doctor that I got a letter from two weeks later saying all the reasons why. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and I, can hear, I, I can speak from personal experience. This still hurts. It doesn't hurt like it did before, but it's not like my opiate use wasn't decreasing also. It was decreasing. So I, uh, some, there's got to be some middle ground, some, something that looks at individual cases instead of sweeping uh, policy decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. You know, before we wrap, I wanted to wonder, it sounds to me like all of the folks in the room that participate in authorizations and conversations with pharmacy plans, you're perfectly satisfied with your experience. Is that, am I guessing correctly? <laughs> Can, I mean, I was expecting to hear some of that from the microphone. How many of you feel as if some portion of your day is wasted? through all of this back and forth negotiation uh, for denials, for pre-authorizations, for 
I can't believe it's so small. I guess everybody who does that is stuck in the office while you guys are here <laughs> at the conference. Um, well, our time is up, um, and I want to thank you uh, as uh, the palliative care family in California um, for participating in this family meeting. Thank you. Thank you.